Well, we start in uh, June of 1863 with the panic of 1863. You have to remember that the war was going on for two years already and it had been going badly for the Federal Army. A um, series of defeats in Virginia, uh, a draw, a technical draw at Antietam in um, September of 1862. In 1863, uh, Robert E. Lee is looking for opportunity and the federal government, uh, Lincoln's army, is looking to survive and save face. Lee also needs the support of foreign countries, especially England and uh, France, to legitimize the Confederate government. And in order to, to produce that result, uh, the Confederate government felt it necessary and saw a lot of advantage if the South could defeat the enemy outside of southern land, in other words, an invasion in the north. Antietam was an attempt at that, uh, although Lee didn't get very far. But the summer of 1863 really brings Lee into Pennsylvania, uh, looking at Pennsylvania as an opportunity to invade the north. And essentially uh, what happened is uh, they started, the Confederate Army started to make advances uh, in June of 1863, this is after the Battle of Chancellorsville, which just occurred in May, where Lee and Jackson had totally, uh, totally upset the Union Army, came around its flanks, and left it limping and wounded. Uh, it was a great victory for them. So they were, they were moving on this surge of confidence, uh, like they couldn't be beaten. Even though Lee had lost Stonewall Jackson there, uh, Jackson was accidentally killed by his own men, and uh, Lee said it was like losing his right arm. But he uh, continued, uh, uh, although never making up for Jackson, he continued uh, with his other corps commanders uh, uh, and um, continued his military push into the north. Now, uh, what he does is he comes up into Pennsylvania. The Maryland border in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, he, he skirted Washington and uh, was on the Maryland-Pennsylvania border and made his initial thrust into Pennsylvania towards Harrisburg. Now, this uh, was, as you can imagine, a panic. Uh, the invasion was a panic for the people in the north, uh, especially Pennsylvania, uh, and especially Harrisburg, where the government literally uh, shut down in panic and uh, evacuated the city, uh, taking with it all its records, trying to, uh, trying to stockpile all of its supplies so the Confederates couldn't get it. And the Confederate Army actually did penetrate almost to Harrisburg, on the environs of, of Harrisburg, part of the Confederate Army. Lee has had his army split into several pieces. And uh, eventually this ended up in the campaign at Gettysburg uh, in July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. But what it also did was to awaken the sleeping giant, um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, and, and the, uh, the ripple in the water, let's say, followed all the way through to western Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, because western Pennsylvania was a strategic position, uh, to put it at the least. If you think about Pittsburgh at the time, it had rail yards, it had factories, it had uh, canals, it had river transportation, and it had an arsenal. It had a federal arsenal here on Butler Street called the Allegheny Arsenal. So all these things are strategically important uh, to the north and would be a great victory to the south if the south could interrupt any of that trade so roughly around the middle of June, the, the rumbling started uh, in western Pennsylvania. There were a lot of concerns uh, for the safety of western Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh itself. And uh, there were orders uh, given to the district of the Monongahela to fortify the city in case of an attack. So what happened between June 15th, literally up to July 3rd, which was the day that uh, would be remembered in history at Gettysburg as Pickett's Charge or Longstreet's Assault, more correctly. Uh, these forts were being constructed between that time, June 15th, July 3rd. The city, the city of Pittsburgh literally shut down. All its businesses were closed. The bars were closed. All the able-bodied men who could uh, were working or employed uh, by the government uh, to build and construct these earthworks and forts. Now, there were 37 of them in total that were, were built around the city, and they ring the city of Pittsburgh, uh, primarily around the heights. Uh, if you picture Pittsburgh, the city proper itself is a low area, and it's surrounded by heights, and these heights are going to be 
what are strategically important. Some of the forts were merely earthworks with gun emplacements. That is uh, a system of almost ditches dug with earth piled in front of them um, and uh, uh, lower in the front so they couldn't be attacked from the front. And in those positions would be placed cannon or uh, infantry soldiers, uh, whatever would be needed to defend that particular position. Uh, aside from having just some earthworks, there were also uh, regular forts uh, with parapets and, and earthworks around them, uh, more, more classic of a military structure of a fort. And those you would find in more strategic areas than, than uh, maybe the peripheral areas. So uh, newspaper sources around the time quote anywhere from 4,000 men a day to 10,000 men a day were employed in building these forts. And uh, you can imagine the activity uh, in, in the number of, I mean, just think about the number of men and um, the number of forts and then put that into a two-week time period. There was a lot of activity, a lot of fear uh, happening in the city itself. Now, the forts weren't built as uh, very permanent structures. You know, they mostly were earthworks or earth, earthen fortifications. So... If we look at Pittsburgh today, uh, there is uh, little or no residue left from that uh, from that day. Uh, there, there are a number of accounts 70 or 80 years ago of some of the old timers in Pittsburgh who remembered uh, playing in what was left of the forts. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, the price of real estate you know, makes these open areas um, more valuable than, than historic, so uh, they were uh, consumed by uh, neighborhoods and such. But I think what, what you have to remember is the Panic of 1863. Also, there were regiments that were raised. It was called uh, the Emergency Militia of 1863, and this, uh, these were sh very short-term regiments. Um, several of them were raised around Pittsburgh. I can think of the 55th, 56th Pennsylvania uh, emergency militia uh, were raised here, and those were made of uh, young men or uh, able-bodied men who uh, were uh, mustered in to serve for 30 days or so through the term of the emergency um, and, uh, and man the forts should they need to be manned. And these men had uh, very little military training. Um, they probably had uh, no uniformity as to clothing or military uniform. Uh, they were probably provided with uh, weapons that were uh, substandard, but but they were an emergency militia, and that's what's important to remember. And they they did serve in this uh, emergency, this Confederate invasion. But what happens after July 3rd, of course, is uh, the high water mark of the Confederacy at Pickett's Charge. Uh, and historians uh, look at that moment in time as a moment uh, of the beginning of the end for the Confederate Army and uh, then the government subsequently. So what happens is uh, the Confederate Army is never at that strength again or never at that potential again uh, to defeat, uh, totally defeat the federal army or the United States government. And um, it's only a matter of time. It would take another two years before uh, they surrendered at Appomattox. But it was uh, the beginning of the end. And, and therefore, again, these, these forts fall into kind of disuse or... or uh, uh, neglect and they're not as important. Now, there were other actions around western Pennsylvania. Um, Morgan, uh, General Morgan and his men were captured uh, not far from here in Ohio. Uh, they had made a uh, kind of an unauthorized raid up into Ohio, again, disrupting civilian life and causing a, a fear uh, throughout the area. And he was captured uh, along with a lot of his men was interred here at Allegheny Prison, which is the site of the uh, present aviary. And uh, just as a footnote, his men were, uh, they had rock star status. They were um, these dashing, swashbuckling Confederate cavalry cavaliers. And uh, many people would go to the prison and visit them um, and get their autographs. And they walked, they walked freely in the streets of Pittsburgh. They took an oath that they would not escape. And they walked freely among the streets, some of them, and had their, their pictures taken at various photographic galleries here in Pittsburgh, which is amazing if you think about uh, how that all works. But um, uh, they were eventually uh, uh, paroled and, and they were no longer, they were not paroled, they were moved to other prisons, some were paroled and uh, no longer were here in Pittsburgh and ended that chapter of our history.